Yeah, I don't know if she actually wrote in a complaint or if wrote it earlier because whoever wrote it was drunk. Oh, the sister? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Maybe she copied and pasted it from a. Um, I don't know. The time is 5 30 p.m. on Monday, April 17th, and I'd like to call this work session to order. Um, up first on our agenda are our lobbyist updates. So, Mr. Romero, please take it away. All right. Good evening, uh, members of uh, Pueblo City Council. Uh, uh, we are in the uh, last 20 days of the uh, legislative session, or as I call, as I call it, this is when the session begins. Uh, first 100 days, uh, a lot of work gets done, but the most important, the most significant, and probably the most significant for the city of Pueblo, those bills are gonna be heard in the last 20 days. Just to give you sort of a, a score sheet uh, on what the legislature has done thus far uh, this year, uh, they have 296 bills remaining on both the Senate and House calendar. Uh, there were 160 bills that have been sent to the governor for signature, and 114 bills were killed. A total of 570 bills have been introduced, uh, 294 in the House uh, with 65 members, and 284 in the Senate with 35 members. Uh, so uh, obviously the Senate's pretty pretty busy uh, in introducing legislation, but uh, this is the, the, the time of the year when I was in the legislature those 14 years that we really have to pay attention. Uh, this is when most members are really tired, uh, mistakes can be made, and some of those mistakes can impact uh, uh, the city. So I wanna begin with uh, the, the two most significant bills on the calendar this week. Uh, I will let you know that <clears throat> we will send you the links to these bills when these bills start uh, so that you can listen to them. Uh, you can also partic participate if you wanted to uh, uh, testify or, or register an opinion or uh, input on the bills. Uh, the first is the uh, land use bill, which was heard uh, last, you know, last week, only testimony. And uh, so tomorrow, uh, the committee will convene at 2 p.m., and this is when they'll start to what they call mark up the bill. This is when they'll start to uh, offer uh, uh, amendments to the bill. Uh, we, we've heard that there are a number of in, uh, amendments that would uh, would impact Pueblo. Uh, for example, for for cities such as Pueblo, an amendment would reduce the maximum density requirement per lot from six residential units to four. There's also an amendment would, that would allow cities to retain some power over parking requirements. Specifically, it would allow cities to require parking space for every two housing units in residential areas and long and, and long key quarters. With that said, the bill will 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 override uh, local zoning authority. This, as we've said uh, previous uh, in our previous discussions with you, this is the the most significant, in my opinion, overreach on local government that I've seen uh, since I've been lobbying. Uh, at, at the legislature, it takes significant uh, control away from a local government. Uh, <clears throat> we will uh, we will uh, send out the amendments in real time uh, as we get them, so that you can see them. Uh, in and and I'll just pause here just for a second. If there's any questions during the day, especially with the the, the other this bill and uh, the uh, ozone uh, bill, if there are questions that you have or you want to call. Uh, uh, um, me or any of the members of our team, please do that because th these bills do have significant impact on uh, on city uh, uh, authority. So uh, that bill will, will, as I said, we'll, we will uh, send out and we apologize in advance. You're going to be getting a lot of information uh, over the next 20 days and probably a lot of information over the next uh, two or three days. The other uh, bill finally uh, was introduced uh, this past Friday is House Bill 1294. This is the pollution protection measures. I've had a chance to review this uh, in detail. Uh, it, it, there are significant uh, permitting uh, uh, 
uh, I won't say restraint, they're, they're, they're permitting barriers uh, for, for uh, uh, those that fall under the Air Quality Control Commission. Uh, I've, been, I've been on meetings uh, with uh, folks that represent EBRAS. Uh, they, they think it could significantly curtail uh, their business and their ability to operate. Uh, that is true of other uh, manufacturers that have been on these uh, stakeholder calls. Uh, th th this is one of the toughest permitting uh, bills that we've, ever, we've seen. Uh, I will give you an update. <clears throat> we've had an opportunity today and, and, uh, and Thursday and Friday uh, to have discussions with uh, staff from the governor's office. The governor still has significant concerns about this bill. Uh, he is going to wait to see what happens uh, with amendments to the bill. Uh, the bill will be heard uh, uh, this coming uh, uh, Thursday at 1.30. Uh, we will send out that link as well. We will send out amendments in real time so that you can take a look at, look at those. The most helpful thing that we'll try to do is Sometimes just sending you the amendments is not helpful. If you can't put them in context, we'll try to do a summary uh, at the end of the day for both of these bills so that you can take a look at them uh, after those amendments ha have been heard. Uh, I, I would advise uh, City Council that if for uh, the uh, pollution protection me measures uh, to seriously consider taking a position of opposition to this bill. But I also think uh, the land use bill is another one that I think you need to seriously consider the implications. Uh, those are the two most important bills that we'll follow this week and try to provide you as much detailed information and summaries so that you can uh, get the best assessment uh, on the bill. Uh, I don't know if I've, uh, if other members of my team, if I've left anything out. Yeah. That's our report, uh, Council. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Romero, for that update. Um, what questions regarding his update are there from council? Councilor Graham. This is more for the council, but are we ready to make a take a stance on either of these bills for you all to start advocating for us? <clears throat> I, uh, I had lunch with uh, an Avra's executive that they've hired. And uh, it really will hurt uh, jobs, I think, in the long run if this thing goes through. So I, I, I think at least in that one, we should, which was my question to Gil, uh, should this be in the form of a letter or resolution? Uh, what, what is your advice on that? Uh, it, it, well, what we need uh, in order for us to, to actively, I mean, actively contact uh, legislators that are on the committee and then start actively uh, engaging other members, because we assume this bill is going to get out of committee. Uh, we're still trying to, you know, we don't, you know, obviously we want the governor as the backstop, but we want to try to get this bill killed. But but if we have some sort of affirmation from city council, if you take a vote today and that's recorded, that's that's all we need for uh, to satisfy the secretary of state. And then we can change our position with the Secretary of State to say that we oppose the bill. So it doesn't matter what form it is, uh, Councilor Flores, as long as we have that. Thank you. Um, yeah, Mr. Romero, I, I, because today is a work session, we cannot vote formally, but we can give direction to staff. Um, and I think that that would be an appropriate thing to do. Um, would that work, Gil? Yes. Yes, as long as we have some affirmation, of, you know, in whatever form that is, uh, that we could go back and uh, and if someone questioned us on uh, on you know you know you know as we oppose the bill, if somebody questioned you know what the position of the city is, we can go back to that whatever that event is. Councilor Atencio. Yeah, Gil, have you talked to anybody from CML? I receive emails from them on especially the land, land use uh, bill. And yeah, they, I, I think we're, yeah, yes. They, to answer your question, we have been in conversations with the uh, Colorado Municipal League. Uh, there are gonna be several amendments uh, made to this bill. I, I don't know if it'll put it in a form, uh, Councilor Atencio, that the city would, uh, if, if not, a, you know, if, if they wouldn't, 
if, I, I don't know if you'd ever be in a position to support this bill because it is such a significant intrusion into local control. And that's always been that uh, that line, you know, that, you know, these are things usually normally reserved to the to the cities. Uh, but there's this pressure about urban sprawl and, you know, these other events that are occurring in the state that now have caused this significant land use bill to to come forward. And so I do, you know, on this on that bill, you certainly could wait until we see the amendments on that bill. But, you know, certainly for the most part, CML is working to oppose this bill. That's true. Well, so, I would suggest that we uh, give some kind of direction to uh, Gil. To, uh, that, that, would, that would be really helpful. Uh, we talked to our uh, contingent, Henriksen and uh, Morrow Martinez. and uh, Martinez. Is that a quest question for me, uh, Councilor yeah. Tensor? Yeah. Yes, I have, but here, here's our problem. We, we will give them information and relay concerns from the from council, but until you take a position, you know, then we can't convey to them that you're opposed to it, and that that's what they're looking for. And so, uh, especially on this on this uh, uh, the land use bill, because that's in the Senate, and and uh, we have a great relationship with Senator Hendrickson and uh, Senator Cleve Simpson, and they they're looking uh, to us to to let them know what. Uh, Pueblo is going to, what position Pueblo is going to take. Those are two bills that we we would encourage you to take positions on. <clears throat> Great. So I think um, the direction is needed to oppose the land use bill first. Mayor, did you have anything? If, if it's a consensus of council, we'll send a letter to Gil tomorrow indicating that it's a consensus of the council that uh, we oppose the land use bill. Uh, I intend to go to Denver on Thursday. The uh, air quality bill is set for a hearing Thursday afternoon. So I'm going to go up with a contingent of Everest and other people from Pueblo. So, Councilor, uh, uh, let yeah. us let us know what you need, Mr. Mayor, uh, on Thursday. Uh, anything we can do to accommodate you when you get there? All right. Um, I was given a document by Everest uh, about mm -hmm. how they compare as a, as a manufacturing company with manufacturers throughout the United States and other countries. And we are on the lower end. Uh, and so, and, and I'll, I'll make sure that you have a copy of that if you don't have one. I don't know if you, if you got anything from them. It's a really uh, important document uh, that, that I was told I could share. But the second irony of this whole thing is most people don't know that Avarice Steel is the largest recycler of metals in the state of Colorado. So here you have a company uh, that is dealing with pollution, with uh, them recycling uh, all of this metal everywhere, and uh, they could affect this bill could effectively hurt them. Um, so anyway, uh, those two things, uh, and I'll, I'll, I will make sure that you have a copy of that one document that I have. If, if I could respond uh, to, right. to your- Go ahead, Gil. Thank you. Uh, just to add a, a point of emphasis that uh, we were on a stakeholder, stakeholder call, if you want to call it that, with 60 people uh, the day before the bill was going to be introduced. I will say that the most vocal participant participant it was Everest uh, they they couldn't stress how how this was going to hurt and they said we we're you know we we're speaking with one voice about this particular bill this one bill how it could hurt manufacturing in Colorado and specifically Everest they were the most vocal on that you know what I what I call a very uh disingenuous stakeholder process because they didn't listen to any of the concerns so I I really appreciate the count appreciate the council stepping up on this one, because I think people are looking to us. And Everest has, has a strong voice up there. We're actually asking them on a number of bills, including uh, uh, you know, the, the, the pollution bill uh, and uh, some oil and gas uh, issues where Everest has an interest. And so their, their voice is heard. So thank you. All right, so let's give direction to our lobbyist regarding the opposition of the land use bill first. So this is for the land use bill. Councilor Martinez Ortega.
Councillor Graham, Councillor Atencio, Councillor Flores, Councillor Maestri, Councillor Winner. So it sounds like five out of the seven, six out of the seven of us are going to oppose. Okay. Um, next off, we have the um, air quality bill or the pollution bill, specifically impacting Evraz in opposition. Councillor Martinez Ortega, Councillor Graham, Councillor Atencio, Councillor Flores, Councillor Maestri, Councillor Winner. Um, so six out of the seven of us are in favor of opposition for that. Okay, great. That is that is awesome. Thank you so much. And we'll we'll add that uh, when we finish this call, we'll we'll add that immediately to the Sec Secretary of State's report and we'll begin actively opposing both those bills. Great. Thanks, Romero team. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Please, please let us know if you have any questions. 24 seven, as these bills are heard, we'll send you the links uh, uh, through the administration city. We'll look for the mayor on Thursday. If you need any, anything on either of these bills this week, let us know. Thank you. Cool, thanks Gil. Uh, moving right along on our agenda, city updates, Ms. Solano, please take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair, City Council, Mayor Jadassar. I have only one update this evening, and I think Clyde's going to pull it up right now. And this is the flyer for the team up to clean up. I think the marketing pieces are uh, ready to go. This will be the first, uh, first look at any flyer, the social media campaign, press releases, um, other communication are, is not quite out. So the first look is right here on the slide. Um, the event is scheduled for Saturday, May the 6th from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Colorado State Fair. Uh, the flyer will sh share uh, to join us. It is at no cost and that is highlighted. Um, it's for Pueblo City residents only. Um, the next section will be to um, share with individual individuals what are the accepted items with the furniture mattresses except no carpet, um, yard waste that is accessible in bags and trash boxes, and um, tires but limited to five without rims. And then um, there, um, I think uh, Councillor Martinez asked Black Hills Energy if there was an opportunity in the spring uh, for any en free energy efficiency weatherization kits. Black Hills Energy has, a, has agreed and said that anyone coming through would receive an efficiency weatherization kit and light bulbs uh, while the supplies do last. Um, so all this information will go out later this week in full force. Um, any questions or additional information uh, to the city, city hall, our uh, Director of Public Affairs, Ms. Robinson. Um, and that is the only dictate that I have this evening, if you have any questions or directions for future reporting. Great, thank you, Ms. Solano, for uh, sharing that flyer. Uh, questions from Council, Councilor Graham. Ms. Solano, looking at May 1st, I see the marijuana excise tax is on our agenda again. Can you tell us what that is? Mayor, can you help me with this? She's looking at the, the upcoming work session. Yes, Dr. Hassan asked for an opportunity to talk with the council about uh, the marijuana excise tax again. Pardon me? Well, I don't know until we hear from him what the spiel will be. So, I mean, that's, uh, he asked for that and that's a courtesy I thought we'd expend to him to uh, talk about that excise tax. Council doesn't want to hear him, but I guess that's up to you. I think it's worth listening to. I was just wondering if it was different from last year because we we heard him for like two hours last year. So if it's not different conversation, I don't know why we'd have him come. Always to the same. Well, that's what I'm asking. I know you wanted this on there, so that's why I was wondering. Pardon me? I know this was your ask, so that's why I was wondering. If you know if it was the it wasn't my ask. This is what Dr. Hassan asked. But you asked for it to go on the agenda, though, right? Yes, because he. So that's what I was wondering if you knew what it was in regards, since you were the middleman. I think he wants to talk about some equity in the marijuana excise tax. Thank you. And I think he said for twenty-five minutes. It looks like, so I'm sure it won't be two hours. What other questions are there from for Ms. Solano, Councillor Winner? I think everybody's um, limited to 25 minutes during work session. So maybe if we can just hold them to that. Yeah, it usually ranges like 15 to 25. Although looking um, now that we're all looking at our council agenda for the upcoming foreseeable future, you will see that we do have a pretty large work session on May 15th. 
with some longer presentations, one of which is our very own um, director of public works and director of our parks office about the trash cleanup, the million dollar trash cleanup program. So that's for 40 minutes. So just keep in mind. <clears throat> um, I did have a question, Ms. Solano, for the cleanup team up to clean up event. Are you looking for volunteers or um, how can people help with this? I, don't, I didn't hear myself. I think in the marketing pieces, it will the, uh, the marketing piece will go out for any volunteers um, to secure those to call or email the particular um, phone number. Great. Is that going to be Ms. Robinson? Yes. Great. Excellent. Other questions about the team up to clean up event or city updates? Seeing none, moving right along on our agenda then, can I please have our friends from the Pueblo Youth Action Council come to the podium? Um, Ms. Apodaca? And then can you please say your name for the record? Um, Brianna Apodaca. Devin Clock. Whenever you're ready. All righty, so we are at the Pueblo Youth Action Council. My name is Brianna Padaka once again. I am the youth facilitator. Um, and so we're here to present to you about our program and kind of what we've been doing. This is our second year of the program and I'll let Devin take it away and introduce what we do. All right, so um, the, Pu the Pueblo Youth Action Council was founded with a collaboration between um, Youth Roots, a company based out of Inglewood and the Packard Fund for Pueblo and they collaborated together to make the Pueblo Youth Action Council. Um, this was founded in 2021, and it is open to all freshmen in Pueblo. Um, we also have XCOMs who are sophomores and potentially juniors and seniors. I myself an, as an, is an XCOM. Um, and then um, youth are the future, you may know. Youth are the future, we are the future. We hear that every Friday at our meetings as well. Um, the Youth Action Council wants to amplify the youth voice in the community, um, no matter your background, whatever you are, whoever you are, we all come from a different background and we just want to spread our voice in the community. And oh, sorry. <laughs> So if you look on your screen, this is our three step grant making process. Um, we start with a community needs assessment that leads into fundraising and then we do grant making. Um, this is just an overview of what we do. Um, I will let my other youth advisor explain um, about the three step process. Okay. So we gather research about the needs and the we create a needs assessment after doing the research of, so needs such as substance abuse, mental health, poverty, homelessness, and eating disorders. We created um, like an option board where people will select which one they think is most important to least important. And by doing that, we gathered 153 responses from public citizens, which we sent out through school, teachers, family members, et cetera. Um, so, so the research we gathered was throughout the whole responses, people want to spread more awareness about mental health, poverty, and substance abuse. And these are just the statistics showing that within Pueblo and why it's important, why we should spread more awareness and why it's uh, advocating for change. Um, and then these are the how the needs assessment was set up, which I you can see, which is like the most important to like the least important and the mental health substance abuse and poverty were the top three out of the 153 responses. And we discussed with a panel of experts about these causes for change. So, yeah. So then our next step is funding and fundraising. So I'll let Ashida go ahead and, and this is Violet, by the way, you didn't oh, introduce Violet. yourself. <laughs> so we're, we're representative of, of a few high schools across Pueblo. So, so far we have done four fundraisers and we had nine impact partners and that raised up to 1,370 and 19 cents. 
And then the other one is 6,980. So do you want to talk about one of our most important fundraisers that we did with Pizza Ranch? Um, the most important one was Pizza Ranch where we awaited and we get like, we got 10% of it, like, and so we'll talk about how like you were able to also converse with customers about what we're doing as a program, right? <laughs> okay, and then talk about your experience with the impact partner meetings. Like, so what was your what what is an impact partner meeting? Trying to get to know. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's fine. You're doing great. Yes. Also, right, doing we good. have no idea what we're, you're talking about, so you could say anything to us and we would believe you. So you're doing great. Keep going. Um, the meetings are like just like asking for money to be able to raise money for the cause that we're trying to go for. So kind of like what we're pitching with you guys here today, they got to do individually and met with nine different impact partners. And that's where we raised a big portion of our funding, which was $6,980. I can kind of go to the next slide. Um, so we raised a, raised a total of um, $1,370.19 just through fundraising. Um, so we did Chipotle fundraisers, we did Panda Express, we did our Pizza Ranch, we did a calendar fundraiser, um, but we, where we made the most of our money was through those impact partner meetings with people from bigger foundations. So our youth group kind of acts as a mini foundation, um, and then we kind of ask for money from bigger foundations, and then we have people apply to, and we'll talk a little bit more about our third step process. And so in total, we raised $8,350.19. Um, and our partner board, which is the Packard Fund, will match up to 10,000. So we have the possibility of raising $20,000 that we can grant to local nonprofits. Do you want to speak? So the third step in our process. <laughs> So the third step is our grant making process, which is at the end of our session, which we have our grant making session this Friday, where we decide where all the money that we have got through donations and other things, um, where do we want it to go, we will review through all the different applications we have got, and that should be a really fun, long, educated session. <laughs> um, I think that is all we have for you. Um, thank you for allowing us to present to you tonight, Council. Um, we are still raising funds for this important process. So if the council or anyone would like to donate to us or make a contribution, um, we welcome donations in any amount. And we also have donation flyers if you would like a physical copy. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation, Pueblo Youth Action Council. Um, I know it takes a lot of courage to get up here and speak. so. Um, I appreciate you taking some time out of your Monday night to come talk to us. What questions are there from council? Councilor Martinez Ortega. You all did great. Thanks for coming here. Um, what are you going to spend the money on? Maybe a little more specific. So maybe we can give you some money. So do you want to talk about donations donated to last year? Let's see. So um, based off last year, um, I was... Uh, First year member last year and some of the organizations we donated to were the Colorado Health Network, um, Spark the Change Colorado, and I think the Pueblo, Pueblo Rape Crisis Services we also donated to Health Solutions as well. Those were our four main um, organizations that we donated to last year, and I think we gave each one around $5,000. That's great, and that's within your first year. That's phenomenal. Um, I think that we should maybe work on a $1,000 um, um, resolution from council contingencies to help support uh, Pueblo Youth Council. And I'd like to ask the mayor's office from their contingencies to help support them as well with a thousand bucks, possibly. Councilor Flores. Yeah, I was... Uh a guest at one of your functions at the pizza ranch. And uh, I, I was impressed just by how they were taking care of us and, uh, you know, filling our glasses with whatever we wanted. So uh, kudos to you because you did an excellent job. I think it's a great learning experience 
uh, to work in a restaurant, you've got to do lots of juggle a lot of things. But I, I noticed that you guys did a, a really excellent job. Uh, the other thing I would encourage you to do uh, is that there are some grants out there that could potentially double the amount of money that you, you know, if you're willing to contribute to the cause, uh, say $10,000, there are foundations that will match that. And uh, I'm not an expert in that, but I know that happens all the time. And so I'd encourage you to maybe look at that as a potential of whatever money you raise and doubling it because there are, that is uh, an opportunity that uh, you guys should look at. But thank you for the presentation too. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Councilor Maestri? Um, the Housing Authority is going to try to reopen the center, youth, uh, youth center, Act community center on the west side and you have El Centro um, that has a lot of youth activities. One thing that we're lacking here, we talk about all the time, is a recreation center for youth. And um, those would be some great ways to divert the funds. You know, some of these larger health organizations and so forth, they, they get Medicaid funding for people to attend. And so why double up? They're being covered. Get it where there isn't any coverage. And, um, and so, um, but good job. Thank you. Thank you. Council Martinez Ortega. Thank you. Um, can we get that hard copy? Can we check that out? Thanks. You have the RFP with you? While he's doing that, can you talk a little bit about how you guys vet or like how you prioritize which agency is going to receive funding? So um, this is just our second year doing it. Um, but I think a lot of it is kind of what you spoke on. Like we also want to give to organizations that don't have big pots of money to dig into. So that's something that I have the youth think about when we are going through the grant applications. I want this to be completely on based on their decision, but I kind of chime in and challenge their ideas so that, that they can really analyze like, yeah, some of like health solutions probably has a big pot of money. So like what other organizations can we donate to that don't have those big pockets of money to um, go into? I think one other thing that we look at in the in their applications, we look at what projects are they wanting to fund? So we look at how many students is this gonna serve? Um, what's the long, is it a long-term solution? Is it a short-term solution? Um, we talk about like just different things that the organiz organizations are doing um, and like what, what are the students prioritizing? Um, and so before we came into this grant making session, we, we made a list of priority, priorities, right? Like we want kind of a balance. We don't want, or we don't want to fund organizations that are funding only short-term projects or only long-term projects. We want something in the middle um, to where we can see sustainable change. Great, other questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you, uh, thank you for your time thank tonight. You. Thank you. <laughs> Moving right along on our agenda then, can I please have Mr. Guerrero, our new director, chief building official for the Pueblo Regional Building. Good evening. My name is Mark Guerrero, and thank you for making time for me to introduce myself as the new chief building official. Obviously, it's a it's a great honor for me. Um, I'm a native of Pueblo, and I in my uh, my little handout there, I kind of give you my background. Where you know I was uh, originally born in in Bessemer and uh, raised there for about seven years until we went to uh, Aberdeen area, where I went to Carlisle and then Keating and then. Central High School, you know, and uh, I went away and uh, became an architect, worked in the Denver metro area, worked across the country as a corporate architect, uh, shifted my career a little bit and got onto the public sector where I worked for Denver Public Schools, City and County of Denver, Front Range Community College, CSU Pueblo, uh, CU Anschutz Medical Campus in different positions as executive director, campus architect, uh, director of construction, senior project manager, delegate to the state architect, that sort of thing. And in the process, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, I've got to do zoos and jails and schools and 
and uh, elections division and Red Rocks and, and different things. And that's kind of the, the energy I'm going to bring back to Pueblo because I've been through uh, across the country a lot of different building departments as a licensed architect, which I am. And I know as a customer of a building uh, department uh, what, I, what my expectations are. And one of the first things I would do when I went out of state is my first visit was to the regional building department because I knew they had insight of, you know, what, what challenges did my project face? You know, they gave me insight. And uh, now as the chief building official here in Pueblo, I, I really want to encourage all our citizens of Pueblo, our government uh, partners to come to us first because we have the knowledge to start you on the right path. Uh, for whatever your project is and give you information and it's for free. So here in my little spiel, I, I said, you know, PRBD, Pueblo is going to be polite. We're going to be polite. We're going to research your code requirement. We're going to try to build trust with you. We're going to try to determine if we uh, responded to your request. Uh, all we do request on the other side of the paper there is that you get us involved early and uh, take advantage of our expertise. As I said, I'm a licensed architect, but we have uh, licensed electricians, plumbers, HVAC people that also took their certification become plan reviewers. So one of my big um, gripes with building departments was as an architect, I would give them my drawings. And then later on in the field, the inspector had a different opinion than the, the plan reviewer. Well, what I, I'm here to say is, uh, through David Vaughn's leadership, the former um, building official, the building inspectors are the plan uh, reviewers. And so we really, you know, are trying to improve and get better each day of, as far as what our public service is and what our customer service is. Uh, our mission statement is to be polite and to try to uh, work your issue. Um, at the very bottom here, you know, we're, we're trying to move your project forward. We're trying not to be punitive. In, in our decisions, but we're trying to look for options. And we're here to support both small business and you know the homeowner and the large business. And I'm here to tell you we're doing very well. And um, I'm just very happy to be back here. A little uh, thing you might know, not know about me is I, I've lived in, uh, we've owned the same house in, uh, my family's owned the same house in Bessemer for 75 years. I recently bought it from my dad about five years ago, remodeled the heck out of it. And that's where I'm living now. So from the house I, I grew up from zero to seven, I, uh, I'm living in now. It's the street I learned how to ride a bike, you know, played with the kids that were on the street there. And uh, just really, my, my family's here. My parents are 85 years old, so that's icing on the cake to, to be back for the part, later part of my career to see them. My brothers are, are both here, so I'm just very excited to be back uh, in Pueblo, and I hope to con Contribute my voice and my perspective and my background to whatever your efforts are, you know, in Pueblo means business or, or whatever your, you know, the challenges. So again, thank you very much for allowing me the time. I've talked to some of you individually because I think it's important for us to understand who each other is and, and network that way and give you a comfort level that you could call me and, uh, and maybe seek some advice or maybe I can call you and seek some advice. Either way, you know, and uh, uh, I'm just very happy to be here, and I, I thank you so much for your time. Fantastic. Well, welcome, Mr. Guerrero. What are there any questions from council? Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Well, thank you very much. Um, I do have a quick question. Yes. Will so I know that the at you know the city and the county have rolled out uh, Pueblo Place as really an online. Um, system to, to try and expedite permitting and zoning and, and all of that stuff. And I know that regional maybe wasn't on Pueblo Place yet. Do you, is there a, a thought or a vision of, of Well, I think that? you're referring to OpenGov. OpenGov. And, and so uh, actually our technicians, our IT people are kind of the, uh, the anchors for that development. I mean, it kind of floundered a while until Pueblo Regional really took the reins and started uh, developing uh, that so we can also communicate with uh, the county and the city. As you know, we're a, a standalone entity. We're not the city. We're not the county. But we were we were cruising right along with our own deal. But we were open to the idea of going to OpenGov so we could better talk to our uh, 
what we call our routing partners, you know, whether it be the community development or wastewater or the fire or whoever, uh, we think communication is the key. And I, I think, you know, we're going to have some growing pains going through there, but we're, we're open to the challenge and we're up to the challenge and we're going to, we're going to do our best. Um, Madam Clerk. I will say um, the city clerk's office works with regional building and they are in our open gov system, which is correctly called the Pueblo place system in the um, public side of it. Um, and uh, they have worked well with the city clerk's staff in making sure that the liquor licensing and marijuana licensing um, buildings are all checked off. And so they may, they may not have their own system for it, but pieces of their system has been integrated with ours, including um, the regional building sign off that allows them authorization to actually go onto the property to do their inspections. Great, that's what I'd like to hear. Councilor Tencio. Yeah, I'd just like to say that when Mark interviewed uh, with the board for this position that we were really impressed with not only his credentials, but uh, the fact that he was a Pueblo native and that he knew exactly what was needed for the department and for the city of Pueblo. So I'm looking forward to some really big things, some really good things from uh, Pueblo Regional Building. Thanks to you, Mark. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Mr. Greer, for joining us on a Monday evening. Moving right along on our Thank agenda you. then, um, can I please have Mr. Rivera to the podium to talk about a skateboard park proposal? Good evening, Council. Thank you for letting me have this opportunity here this evening. Um, I think I have a little paper for y'all. Is that okay? Yeah, come on up, Brian. I'm just waiting. What's that? I do not. Put that one you want to advance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Morning Story Creations, 5013C nonprofit. Index about Morning Star Creations, benefits, rewards, how it works, locations, timing. About Morning Star Creations. Venus is our muse, a planet of love and art. Um, our mission is to improve our city parks and river trail system by creating fun for all age groups, beautifying our community by doing litter cleanup and removal of graffiti, to inspire and teach the beautiful world of industrial arts and the lost world of construction. Individual enrichment, how individuals learn, use, play, build, collective involvement, working with others, learning and building together. Community development, a place to learn, share and be involved in a collaborative community development, putting Pueblo on the map. The movement of movement, enhancing, enhancing the community with positive outlets that will enable individuals to practice or find the art of movement. Rewards, learn how to make concrete, Learn how to make concrete molds, skate molds, benches, furniture, anything concrete. Apply learning to your interest. What can you do with these new skills? Working together as a group to learn from each other. Build something to use. Let's skate. Beautification of each area, clean up and enhance. Pueblo to be a hot spot. QR code points to tricks and places in the park. GPS location. How it works, practical trade skills. Dave could be any individual that's interested. Learn skills, drawing, concrete design, geometry, physics, skating, skills applied, skating, building, applying. Personal rewards, empowerment, confidence, life skills, job skills, working together, sharing, having fun, community benefits, Shows care, gives opportunity, builds community, provides hope, gives direction, Pueblo cares. Locations for 
proposed little parks, JJ Rugosa Park. Could offer concrete classes, form building classes, skate classes, special feature be a three-sided pyramid, estimated cost 15,000. Location number two, Moynihan Park. Concrete classes, form building classes, skate classes, two quarter pipes, a grind box, estimated cost 15,000. Oops, sorry, you guys flipped it. Location, Sergeant Blake Harris Skate Park. Concrete classes, form building classes, skate classes, concrete mini half pipe, estimated cost of 15,000. And here's a map of the locations of the three proposals. And the timing for each individual project, it will take approximately four weeks from start to finish. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Brian. Can you can, can we go back to that slide where the maps are? Okay, I have no idea where these parks are. Can you give me a better areas or neighborhoods where these parks are? Okay, Mo um, Moynihan Park is um, in the Grove down there um, by Clark Spring Water and Mount Carmel Church. Um, real antique-ish neighborhood. Um, JJ Rigosa Park is in far south Bessemer Park, right? the south end of the freeway before you get to the Pole Boulevard exit, right off the freeway, you can see it there. And then the Sergeant Blake Harris Memorial Skate Park is uh, the original skateboard park that was built in the city park, I believe in 99 or 2000. Great. What questions are there? Council Martinez Ortega? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this question is to the mayor's office. Do we, are ARPA funds available for like this $45,000 project in these three parks? Do you know, like right offhand? I don't know whether there are right offhand. I, the, probably there'd be in lost revenue funds. Uh, I would think that there'd be, we could use those ARPA funds uh, for a project like this. Yeah, or um, like, cause I really want, I would love to see one in JJ Ragoza Park um, in my district. and. Um, or, yeah, I would just, I'd like to see that, this project move forward. Councilor Tencio? Yeah, I'd like to see these things done. These are the kind of things that should be done in, um, around the city so that our kids could have someplace to go and something, something to do. Also, I, I go down to the um, skate park at uh, El Centro all the time. And one of the things that the skaters down there ask for all the time is a half pipe. We should be really thinking about putting a half pipe there because I'm told if we had a half pipe, then local and regional competitions could be held there. Right now, we could serve about half a competition, but with the half pipe, it could really be done. And everybody suggests that the amphitheater that we built there, it, it's been used once, and I used it for a, a mariachi uh, concert. And uh, otherwise, it's it's just laying there, not being used. We should probably take that out and put a half pipe in, and that way, an organization like yourself could bring in regional competitions, regional and state competitions, to to the city of Pueblo. You know, sure. these are the kind of things that we need for the for, for the city. Definitely. Councillor Flores and then Councillor Warner. Uh, Brian, what a great idea this is. Uh, you know, you have my full support on it. Uh, I was just trying to see the mechanics of this. I know that Morningstar is, a, you say it's a nonprofit. Yes, sir. So uh, when I'm thinking in terms of, of uh, what this is going to take, the 15,000, my first thought is that that's going to be the cost of the concrete. Uh, so could you explain how? You're going to provide uh, number one. How are you going to recruit uh, uh, these young people that you're going to be utilizing, and uh, and and who is it, or is part of this money going to go toward the training and uh, of these individuals, or is that how, how did you break up your budget between the materials, the training, and whether or not uh, you need to pay someone to to maybe help you with the training. 
Um, yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely have to have, you know, the cost of materials. Um, and then also we'll have to have some specialized uh, contractor come in and use the shot creek pump and stuff like that. And then I already have some kids in line to come and help us like that. Um, and yeah, and then we basically have some board members here with some children here also that we're uh, all going to work together. And uh, they're, they're, you're going to have a lot of volunteers. Yes doing this, but the, the, the uh, young people that you're going to be training uh, at the end of this will have some skills where yes. they can go out and find a job in that Definitely. area. Working with concrete is, uh, it takes a lot of years to, to really uh, become. Yes, so. just feel like, yes, I feel like there's just uh, not enough trade schools or, you know, like uh, even industrial arts <clears throat> schools that are training some of these, you know, younger people to become, you know, carpenters or concrete masons or stuff like that. It just uh, feels like uh, another 20 years is going to be way less people knowing how to do any kind of trade. So just feel like we, we can pass down some of the stuff that we've learned in time. And then la my last question has to do with the coordination with our parks department. Uh, obviously, you've already probably talked to them, right? Yes, it, I believe they're in, uh, they are in support. They do like the ideas. Great, great report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think skateboard parks are great. Um, also, City Park could use a, a refresher. That's pretty, I don't know, it almost looks blighted at this point. Um, I do have concerns about the cost. Um, I mean, the East Side Park cost a million dollars. Yes. So on, I don't know where you're getting these numbers. Uh, these are just small little little enhancements, and then we could just build from there. This is, to say, like the one. So you just uh, have one structure. Yes, yeah, so or a couple with a couple other little rails or whatever, just small structure, and just like um, in Moynihan Park, we be able to put a couple of quarter pipes with the basketball court to make it a multi-venue court. Okay. So it's okay. not it's not a big big you know operation or anything like that. Okay. Well, the east side huge. the east side park's not all that big either, so I, uh, I'm just a little confused. Oh, uh, I think that's twenty three thousand square feet or so. I I, mm -hmm. I helped build that. Um, project in 2015. I worked along uh -huh. with the crew that was from Florida building it. Okay. And um, yeah, I think it's pretty good. It's pretty good size. It is a pretty good park. Yeah, it's good you size. So? It's, it's yeah. considered probably the best park between Albuquerque and Denver. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's true. Just the area is kind of needs to have some attention from code enforcement for sure. But um, yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to see more more about that. Um, I don't know what else to say. I guess I, I guess I can look online and take a look at your sketches again. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You wouldn't believe how much the skaters themselves, and uh, it's not like they're all 12, 13 year old skaters. There are yeah. adults that skate it's like there. Forty year olds. There. And um, they police that place really well, and they really take care of it. So I was just talking about this. You know, uh, the thing is, is that if we had these, the participants would police the the areas. They would make. Uh, uh, a big difference in the, the quality of uh, participation in these places. Definitely. And, and putting yeah. more neighborhood skate parks in some of these other neighborhoods, you get positive movement in there. Absolutely. And I think it'll flush out some of the negative stuff that's going on out there. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess what I'm hearing from Councillor Winter and Councillor Flores <clears throat> is we want to make sure we're not, you're, we're not shortchanging you and that you'll like 15,000 seems like a small amount of money for a large amount of concrete. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that we're not shortchanging you in terms of man hour, supplies, whatever you need. Definitely. No, it's, it's, uh, that's a good number. Okay. Councilor Maestri. Um, Brian, do we have to have the designs like engineered or signed off by an engineer? In order um, to they, prob they, they probably will. Um, I'll have to get with Mr. Meyer on that. That's what our, probably our next step was going to be to have some kind of engineered stamp on some of the sketches that we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because did you figure the, that cost in also? Um, no, okay. but I think I think I have some some connections with some engineers okay. that might be able to help out. Because okay, we just have to get that part of it covered. And did you? Why did you pick these certain areas of the city? Is that what in, in the skater industry uh, activity? Is that what you're getting? Um, I just feel um, in some of those neighborhoods there. Um, while Moynihan for. Um, for example, there used to be like 10 skateboarders there. My son is from that area. His grandparents live there. 
Um, and then Regosa Park, just feel like that's an excellent place to have a little skate venue off of the freeway and stuff like that. And just, uh, I know that park could um, really be useful to some of the local kids in that area. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of ideas for all kinds of parks around, around our community. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meyer, I just saw your face pop up on my screen. Do you want to say something? No, I've been uh, been talking with Brian for a year or two now, and so he's got a lot of good ideas, and we're definitely in support of of his uh, ideas, those little pyramids and and uh, half pipes. And I think he's got some talent, and uh, we'd like to if he can get you know the youth involved or the skateboarders involved and help build some of these things, and you get that buy in from the community. And I think it's a win win for everyone. Great, thanks, Stephen. My, my, I guess I just have a comment that I know that PCC has a good construction program um, at their college. And I wonder if there's an opportunity to collaborate there with the students as a nice like class project or something. Um, so maybe we can connect with the appropriate professor or whoever overlaps with the construction department, Ms. Solano. Thank you. Happy to connect. Um, also, the city received um, from, from the Public Workforce Center just last week an opportunity to co-collaborate with a project out of the city, the National League of Cities, um, that you might have heard when you were in Washington, D.C., and it is a, a Good Jobs, Great Cities, um, and our application, we were invited to apply, uh, will um, be five uh, city staff members that are collaborating and working with uh, community stakeholders and the three areas of focus will be renewable energy and solar, uh, manufacturing jobs, and uh, construction, which is easy to extend then to youth. So I have my card ready to hand to you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, I think, sorry, Councilor Mishri. Do you have, do you already have um, stu students in mind that you're working with? I do. Currently? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have a few, couple, ten, uh, you know, 10, 11 year olds and also some young adults. And you have experienced yourself in the concrete business? Yes, I've been in you plan doing, to be I've the been, teacher and Yes, I've been doing concrete off and on since 1991. Um, my first job was at the federal prison in Florence. Um, and since 2015 or so, I've been traveling around with different contractors building skateboard parks in different municipalities. So you have plenty of experience. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. You're also an artist. Thank you. Seen some of your work, it's beautiful. Thank you. We yeah, we just were lucky enough to uh, do a little art piece on the river levee concrete chessboard table. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Did did you mention anything about about Minicua? Are you do you have any plans for that? Um. Yes. Yes. Um, Is that on your presentation? No, it's did not I just on the miss it? Okay. Not on this one. No. Can you throw one in there? Sure can. And ask for more money. Sure can. Okay. There's there's some area. I thought would be good there by the fire station on the south side of the fire station. I thought that would be a good area. Please. Well, I think we're all excited about this. Uh, Councilor Martinez Ortega, Councilor Graham, yeah. Councilor Tencio, Councilor Flores, yes. Councilor Maestri, Councilor Winner. Seven thumbs up, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. It sounds like Ms. Lana will hand you her card and you can talk okay. offline to all coordinate. Right. That's it. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. And thanks for the board members who are here. I think that's cool that you showed your support. So. Excellent. Then finally on our agenda, we dedicated some time to talk about the recent news regarding the charter amendment and ballot measure. Um, it's, I, I believe this is Mr. Jagger, who's going to be giving the staff update. Um, I want to just encourage, I know that, I know that this is going to be a big topic. I just want to encourage respect and decorum while we're, we're talk about this in our chambers today. So Mr. Jagger, uh, go ahead. Yes. Thank Mr. you. Jagger. Council member Martinez. So, uh, the first thing I wanted to do, I, I think the focus is what, what are potential next steps or options that council may have. And so to clearly let you know uh, off the top, uh, the city council can refer a charter amendment. And that's pursuant to state statute, which controls with respect to charter amendments. And it may be initiated either by the petition or pursuant to an ordinance adopted by the governing body, submitting the proposed amendment to a vote of the registered electors of the municipality. Such ordinance shall be adopt a ballot title for the proposed amendment. This is though, I think I wanna emphasize 
that you need to be aware of certain issues if you want to do a special election for. Uh, the first thing is you'll need an ordinance calling a special election and directing how it will be conducted, including if by mail. And if we're going to do by mail, we're going to have to have the Board of Electors meet, and they can meet this week, uh, to make a re such a recommendation that's required by 531 of our ordinances. Um, to be timely, however, uh, the ordinance will need to be submitted uh, at the next meeting on Monday, first reading on April 24th. And the reason that is, is second reading when the, would then be May 8th. Uh, if vetoed then, pursuant to charter, it can only be reconsidered at a regular meeting, and that would be May 22nd. Anything after a regular meeting after May 22nd is going to put you too late in the timetable. What I mean by that is, after you, assuming you did enact such an ordinance to pass, it would then have to go for one publication, and that would usually be a Friday. And then that would give you two dates, because you have to have at least 60 days after the publication. So you could either have the election on August 8th, or August 1st, and we'll be recommending August 8th if you go that way. Uh, and the reason why it can't be any later is, is because you have to have the election uh, no more than 90 days preceding the general election. So you got this tight time frame. So if you're thinking of doing that, you want to make sure you know these issues up front. In addition to an ordinance calling for the election, you, you'd also have to have an ordinance referring something, the charter amendment, whatever you decide that may be. Uh, and it would also have to be put on for first reading on May 24th, because it'd have to be at the same time that you call. I'm sorry, April 24th. Uh, so both these would have to be on for Mondays. If you want to do it, that given that tight time lane, uh, the only thing we could practically recommend is that you take the petition the city attorney's office would have, you know, two days to review it. So to that extent, all we're going to do is review it as to form. And there would be some minor changes and we'd send a red line uh, to the petitioners, but uh, we would not review it substantively given that time, time frame. I think that's the best you could probably do if you wanted to get something on for a special election. Now, if you wanted to put it on a general election, that would give you much more time you could uh, try and determine what, if you want something different as far as a charter. And if you wanna do that, we would like some, I would recommend that you, you develop some method to determine what you want that to be. And I'll say that because if you're doing a charter amendment, you really wanna take your time and think about what you're putting into it, what the ramifications are. So uh, if you wanna do something more than that, I think we want clear direction and, and some process to work out as to how to create that and what you want. Um, so that's kind of issues going forward. Obviously, if you do it at the general, you can you can do the charter the, the ordinance referring a charter amendment at some time later, all the way up into mid-August, I think. Uh, the other issue I think that uh, there was some concern with is whether uh, the mayor or anybody who has announced candidacy for a mayor would have any sort of prohibited conflict of interest voting on either of those two measures. And I've reviewed it and I do not think, I do not believe you have any prohibited conflict by law. Our code of ethics would be inapplicable because you're not employees and that's clear by charter. Uh, and it's just too tenuous because you're not actually voting a charter amendment, that'll be left up to the voters. So you're just referring it. The actual decision to actually amend the charter is left in the hands of the voters. And so I hope I addressed uh, some of the questions as far as next steps. And uh, hope that I certainly will answer any questions you have. Thanks, Mr. Jagger. I appreciate that. Um, Councilor Winner. So um, as you all know, I've already contacted um, Mr. Jagger about putting this on the agenda uh, for first reading next Monday. Um, I also wondered if it's possible to do a um, emergency meeting or an emergency ordinance. 
So what would be the purpose and we would recommend against it? Well, the purpose would be, uh, you're asking me what the purpose would be? Was that your question? Uh, to, to make sure that we get it on the um, August 8th. Now, if we if we have it for first reading on the twenty fourth, mm -hmm. you'll have you'll meet the timelines. You'll be okay. Perfect. All right, thanks. But the the election date will probably be August eighth. Councillor Flores. Oh, and and you should know, and also I should let the clerk speak to this, because there are going to be some issues, and they can address it when you get the ordinance uh, referring it for an election and that we do not have coordinated elections. There should be some additional costs and she can walk you through any of those concerns with respect to a special election. Why don't you talk yes, a little bit so about it's, that? Um, uh, we did have conversations with the county clerk in terms of what coordination would be possible um, in because we were you know, initially looking forward um, before the signatures were entirely counted on what we would need to do to get a jump start on this. And um, the, the county clerk will not be able to do any type of coordination with us with an August date. Um, they had previously told us that they were going to try to let us use some of their equipment and some of their space, um, but with the timeline in August rather than in July, which we had hoped for, um, we're not going to be able to use their Agilis machine, which is basically what does the signature match verification for ballots, and we wouldn't be able to um, use their space uh, in the Wells Fargo Center, which is where they're moving to, um, for use during the election either. So uh, I had previously projected the costs um, around $250,000 for that special election. Um, I had narrowed the cost down to uh, $237,000 actually going and getting quotes from everyone, um, but I do not have an updated estimate on how much the uh, Agilis equipment would potentially cost or how that would work or um, on any additional space that we would um, have to either find or rent as part of those costs. Do you have a ballpark number, Marissa? I, I really don't. So it would be above and beyond the 237,000. Councilor Flores. I, I just had some procedural questions. Uh, and one of them is the, uh, the thought, my thought was when uh, the anti-mayor uh, movement uh, uh, organization was moving forward, that it was going to put everything back to the position we were in as a city before we uh, had a mayor, but as I understand, uh, the 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 that is not the case. That there's more in this ballot issue uh, that is going to have some provisions, uh, probably giving the city manager, if we went back that way, a lot less power. And and so I guess my question is, who is who? Where does the the wording and the verbiage and everything that goes into a ballot, how is that going to be managed? I mean, is it going to be us as a city council? Is it the organization that wants uh, the anti, the anti-mayor organization that puts the verbiage together? Because they're not in concert. Uh, you know, the, the ordinance that they want to pass is different. Uh, in, in a lot of different ways. And you've had a chance to analyze that. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, so, okay, first off, given the tight timeline we have, the recommendation is if you wanna go forward with something, the best that we're gonna be able to do is just review and approve, make changes as to form, as to the petitioner's proposed charter amendment. That proposed charter amendment does not uh, just rescind the prior ordinance creating it. It makes some tweaks and changes and that can be reviewed at second reading. Uh, Ms. Winter can provide those. One that I noticed that I think is significant is it does give council the authority to appoint uh, department heads, which is, is, is somewhat different. It does give council the authority to appoint department heads, which is different than what existed prior to the mayor form. I'm sure there's other changes in there. Uh, but we could certainly review those. And I don't know them all in depth detail. But we could certainly review those uh, at second reading uh, for submission of the ballot. Okay. 
Council winner. Yeah, so it's not it's not that much different. Um, prior, the city manager appointed um, the city manager appointed. Uh, actually, sorry, the council, the this municipal judge um, was hired and answered to the council. So that's the same as it was with city manager. Um, the only thing that's different here would be the city attorney reports to council and is hired and fired by council. And um, of course the uh, chief of staff is gone immediately um, as well as the, the mayor. Now, mind you, the current charter states that the mayor shall be chief of staff. Um, so I don't know, it seems immediately that uh, a chief of staff was hired. So a city manager is the chief of staff. So um, that position is gone. And then of course a uh, city clerk it answers to the council. So those are the only only thing. It, there's not, it's not all department heads. So it's not, it's not completely different. So uh, why we're here is, is there was concern with respect to what had happened in the fairness. And so what we're trying to address is what can you do given your short time limit? As to the contents of it, that can be more fully uh, explored when you have a public hearing. But as to that statement, I don't think that's accurate. But that can be reviewed at the time if you put it on. But what I am telling you that if you want a special election and you want to put that petition form on, you're going to have to do it Monday. And you're also going to have to have an ordinance calling for a special election, at least for first reading on Monday. Sorry, I'm trying to speak as loud as I can. Councillor Atencio. Yeah, the problem I see with this is that the council is going to have no input into either the ordinance or the charter amendment. We're just going to throw it into a, an ordinance to, to be read first reading and second reading, and maybe we might be able to make some amendments on second reading, but this is really important. We shouldn't, on second reading, what each one of us gets a couple of minutes to put some input into an order, an, a charter amendment that's so important to the city and the uh, city residents that we only get a couple of minutes each to, to for some kind of input. Uh, we should have, if the city council is going to put a charter amendment, then we should vet this thing for, for a longer period of time than a few minutes on second reading. Uh, and we don't have the time to sit down and, and figure out what we really want in terms of the charter, whether it's a, a mayor or, or um, a city manager. So uh, I just don't think we have the time and to rush it just because of time limitations is not the way to do it. That's not the way to run a city, a business or anything else. Uh, so I just don't think we have the time. Councillor Graham, did you have anything? So just to clarify, the ordinance, because Councillor Winter has requested it, we will have it on first reading on the 24th, correct? Because any councillor can bring any ordinance forward, regardless if we're in agreement or not. Is that what I'm hearing, Mr. Jagger? I will draft it at direction, but what you do with it, and, but I, what I am telling you is that's your time limit. Well, well, that's the best you could do in the time limit to address that specific issue. Typically, that's that's how it works. And so, and then in two weeks, it will be on second reading and it may be on second. And if it fails, then what is the other option? Will that be to put it on the November election? Um, because I would assume some counselors would be okay with a November election, but not paying upwards of $300,000 for a special election. So without being able to decide that tonight, is this how this will play out? She's requested an ordinance. It will be on first reading on the 24th, final reading on the 8th. We'll vote it up or down. Most likely we'll vote it down. And then it can it be put back on for a November election if that's how the council sees fit? Yeah, you would have to have an ordinance uh, submitting another charter amendment to the general election. You'd have to do that sometime. In and August. this would be a charter amendment that could be something as simple as just referring back to the city 
rescinding the prior. Right. Yeah. Just a very plain, simple. Well, the you you would actually put the text in making the changes, but that'd be the concept, and you could do that, and we could draft that, whatever direction you want to give us on that. Councilor Tencio. Yeah, well, that's the problem I have with submitting a an ordinance to submit a charter amendment is that we don't know what's going to go into the charter amendment. We have no idea. We have no input. We have nothing. We have uh, one member, and I have a lot of respect for Councilor Winter, but we got one member who is pushing this and the rest of us are sitting here doing nothing. I, I, I just don't, I, uh, if, if we're going to do it, we have to do it as a body. And, and to some, if the city council is going to do, uh, submit a charter amendment, we should do it as a body. We should all get together and, and meet and propose, each one of us propose what should go into that charter amendment and how we want this city to be run uh, going forward. Right now, one member, yeah, we have the right to submit ordinances, but my idea of an ordinance may not be what your idea is and something this important. Now, if we're uh, like uh, Mr. Ortega uh, wants to submit an ordinance to, to give some money to, a, to Rocky Mountain Surf, which is fine, but something like this isn't a, a, an, a, an appropriation of, of of money for an organization. This is really important to the future of the city and it shouldn't be done helter skelter in, in terms of just, oh, let's just throw an ordinance out there and, and uh, see what happens. Uh, we really have to think this out as to what kind of a charter amendment we're going to put on the ballot when we just don't, even for August, even for November, we don't have enough time as far as I'm concerned. It, well, Councilor Graham and then Councilor Winner. Oh, you didn't, okay, Councilor Winner. Yeah, if you wanna just do a resend, that's fine too. Uh, but you're still gonna have the city manager, um, uh, you're still gonna have city council hiring and, and the judge answering to the city council, that would be a resend. I mean, that's how it was before. I mean, that's, I, I, I mean, that's the only, only difference. The judge uh, was hired and answered to the city council. And that would be a straight rescind. Councilor Foran. Uh, just for the record, I mean, I, I'm looking at our a city clerk. Uh, as I understand, the, the, uh, the number that was given to this group was wrong. But that number, the threshold to that number was never met. So uh, that's, that's a point that's really important here. Uh, and then the other thing is that to what extent when you have an organized committee uh, wanting to put this ballot issue on by petition, isn't it in their interest to have their own legal counsel putting this together and not our city attorney? So I guess that's a, does that make sense as a question to you, Bob? Say, I'm sorry. The question is this, uh, we, we have a, a submission through our city clerk of an organized committee that would like to put a ballot issue on by petition and not just, I'm just talking about this, but anyone that wants to do this, uh, they have the ability to do that, but, it would seem to me that the logic would be and the responsibility would be on the committee to hire their own legal counsel yeah, no. to put the wording together in a certain fashion. Now you're being in, you're being put in a position to edit it, make sure that it complies with uh, uh, the proper verbiage too and wording that we don't have a ballot issue that should be two ballot issues. Uh, and the question is, uh, how do we reconcile that as a city council? Well, the, the first thing is right, and it's on the, the, the website, hire, hire an attorney, it's important, especially if you're doing a charter amendment. And then there's uh, the process gets worked out, I think when they file the, they work it out with the city attorney and try and resolve those issues. I think they did with the Ar Ar law department a couple, for a while I wasn't involved. In but as far as, is there anything formalized? No. I know we had drafted ordinances in the past, which, 
put together a better process for actually finalizing petition forms. Like Springs had, but I don't think it went anywhere with our council. Councillor, well, Councillor Flores, is that, I guess. I'm, I'm Councillor Winner. Well, Mr. Jagger can uh, verify that this uh, group has hired an attorney. And um, what it, what's with the smirk, Nick? What's with the smirking? You just smirked. So um, uh, we have had, a, we do have an attorney and Bob has that information. Um, the, the number, everybody, everybody keeps saying that we didn't make that number, but, but the group did make that number. There were four petitions where they say that they were dismantled and they weren't, they weren't dismantled completely. You could clearly see where, uh, you know, it's a charter amendment, so it's fairly thick. And, you know, you're out there in the wind, et cetera. So you could clearly see how one staple um, had gone all the way through on these four on one side and the other staple had not gone all the way through. Um, Marissa could probably uh, verify that. So um, when we had them notarized, the night we were having them notarized, uh, we were advised by our notary, who uh, was the city uh, clerk for 40 years, um, that you know you can't staple anything back together. So she said to just put a paper clip on him and let the city clerk know uh, what happened. So uh, we had those three petitions, and then we had one petition that was missing that uh, notary page completely. So he just hand wrote on the back of the very last page of the signature page, wrote out the notary exactly like it is typed, only handwritten, and she notarized that. We were informed uh, by Marissa that she accepted that one. When we had our 15 days to cure, we asked if we could um, cure the other three in the same manner, and she said yes. It's my understanding that um, um, after um, the four people that are probably the most vulnerable in this amendment met with the uh, uh, outside attorney and determined that those signatures were no longer any good. But Bob can uh, certainly read what uh, the, the attorney has turned in and, um, and kind of go from there. So the, the petition's been ruled on. I'm not, I'm not gonna get into all that. Uh, the, what we were trying to focus on is what, if any, next steps. Uh, Council Member Winner has requested that the petition, that the charter amendment they had by the petition be put on. And I'm trying to give you guidance that, look, if you want to do it, you want to do a special election, it has to be Monday. And we're also going to have to have an ordinance calling for a special election. Can I clarify, Mr. Jagger, then? So you're seeking advice to put an ordinance. I'm not seeking any direction. I just want to let you know that this is a, we wanted input as far as what's, what next steps are and what are the requirements and that's what they are. Uh, and so I at least want to provide that. That's what I believe. We're, we're okay. Making. I'm not making a recommendation. Ms. Winter has the right to request the ordinance be put on. Uh, and so I'm just letting you know. Yeah, that helps. Uh, Councilor Maestri. Um, moving forward, when we're talking about a re resolution on how to take care of this in the future, we shouldn't offer anything. We shouldn't offer a guideline. We shouldn't offer numbers. We shouldn't offer anything to the public. If we are going to turn around, if, you know, if there's a case of incompetency, incompetency, incompetency with, our, with our administration, and then we can't hold to our word because ethically, it's not right to do that. It, it um, stains the democratic process um, and how it works. And so we shouldn't have things posted. So maybe we need to write that up as a resolution that we don't offer how many signatures are needed, whether it's 5%, 10%, what that number is, because we are putting ourselves in jeopardy when we put that, we publicize it on the website, mm -hmm. we put it in writing on a handout guideline, and then we write it on a petition stating that's how many signatures are needed. And so I would like to if we're going to correct this situation, we need to come up with a resolution that um, protects us in the future, because as we um, are facing now is not only 
humiliation of the lack of competency within this de the legal department. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't shine. It, it's a travesty to see that this has been perpetrated on the citizens of Pueblo with misinformation. And then it's like, a, oh, too bad, so sad. You should have a legal counsel. You know, we have with uh, taxpayer money, we have all the legal counsel we can afford. Citizens don't always have that luxury. They wanna bring something forward. They wanna have their voice heard. And for us to say, oh, well, you need to get your own attorney because we could possibly be incompetent when in this matter, um, that's not fair. That's not fair. And um, going back to it, I mean, in all of this, I wanna, I, I just, I'm just gonna read something really quick. It's just one, one little short pair, uh, sentence, couple of sentences here that we wanna consider in trying to rectify this even as a council. Emissions of the city of Pueblo is to assure that the public has confidence in, in the integrity of all aspects of city government and the public servants that exercise discretionary powers. We have no choice but try to rectify this because otherwise we're not even listening, living up to our own mission statement. And so uh, if that has to say we have to move it to the November election, then maybe that's what we have to do. But I think that as counselors and representatives, because we don't, we don't represent the city, we don't represent the mayor, and we don't represent ourselves. What we represent are the people of this community. And so I just ask that council consider that when we make this decision. You're not in a... I'm, I'm gonna just rem remind our audience members to please be respectful of our conversation up here, please. Councilor Winner. So this uh, um, pointing the finger back at this group for not having an attorney, uh, you know, the charter, the charter amendment was pr approved by the uh, city clerk and we were given the number of 3,768. Um, I think if we had hired an attorney to put the charter amendment together, the same thing would have happened. The attorney would have said, well, how many signatures do we need? 3,768, we probably would have went with that. You also need to remember that our mayor was the chair of the Blue Ribbon Committee for two decades and um, came to council and, and the strong mayor question was on the ballot in 2009. And um, I, I don't know if the council put that on the ballot or, or not. I'm not sure, I couldn't get that information. But in 2017, um, uh, the mayor, the current mayor, Nick, uh, came to council and asked council put, to put it on the ballot because it was just so many signatures. Now you mean to tell me that five years later, he didn't realize that wasn't enough signatures? You didn't remember that it was more than, more that, that it wasn't a percentage of, of the folks that voted in the last election? or was it a percentage of the registered voters? It just seems to me if I was um, pushing to, me, to be mayor for two decades and had it on the ballot in 2009 that fared, failed miserably and then came to council and said, it's just too many signatures. I mean, this has been in the media, every single piece of information we received from the city clerk's office said 3,768. So I just wanted to point that out. Other questions, Councillor Graham? I agree with Councillor Winner. Um, I, I'm not in favor of a special election costing the taxpayers all this money, but I'm in favor of putting. In the Stoller's office uh, last week, and you did what you did because that's what you were told to do. And I think it's, it's wrong if the council doesn't rectify this. Um, in some way, I don't know if the special election is is what the rest of the council is going to choose to do. I'm not going to choose to do that, but I'm I'm not opposed to putting it on the November um, ballot because you guys did exactly what the city told you to do. And this this isn't just for petitioning. I mean, it's for marijuana. It's for liquor. I petitioned several times, and every single time I go down there and they tell me exactly what I'm supposed to do and what houses I'm supposed to hit. I've never, I've never hired outside counsel to go over the documents with me to tell me whether the city was correct or incorrect. And so I, I understand your frustrations. I understand Councilor Winter's frustration and Councilor Maestri's frustration. And what the city did was not right. And I do apologize um, 
I know it's awful. You guys spent a lot of time and hour and money and out there and it, it's a bad situation for not only you guys, but but also us. And I believe it's it's you know two parties at fault. Maybe if you guys did have an attorney, they would have caught it. I don't know. I don't know how this gets caught at the 12th hour. I don't know how the mayor didn't catch it. I don't know how the clerk's office didn't catch it. And I don't know how how Noblin caught this. I mean, it it seems like this is such a huge issue right now that this is something that we should have had 20 sets of eyes on. And this mistake should have never happened. And I do apologize that it did. And I hope the council can make this right to you in some form because you guys deserve it. Mr. Jagger, can you maybe talk a little bit about earlier you mentioned an ordinance drafted from our neighbors in Springs about preventing something similar in their community? Oh, it's just something when you, you were asked, I think, uh, Council Member Flores asked about how do you, how do you address these issues, especially as to language changes or differences. Uh, and I, I, my recollection was is early on when Dan came in, he tried to get a similar process. Springs has in place for determining uh, petition language as like an initiative and what, how that's and there was a process they had built out. I'd have to go back and look. I think it was uh, is when we did the no smoking, and it was after that. And there were some 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 hard feelings about that. So I don't know. I'd have to go back and pull that. But uh, I remember that it, it didn't go anywhere. But it sounded like a real good idea. That way, you have a nice process in place. And it was primary. It was less to do with petitions and getting the right numbers, and more to do with getting the right language so that it was legally acceptable and accomplished what they the intent was, but didn't do something legally impermissible. Yeah, I, I do think that we need a better process. I think that we need a really good uh, codified process that's black and white in order to prevent something like this in the future. Um, so I, I do agree with Councilor Maestri. I, I don't know if not giving them anything is the solution, but I think that having some type of process in place to move forward, um, so I don't. I don't. Maybe we need to revisit the Springs uh, case study if it's working, because um, we need to we need to prevent this in the future. So, Councilor Winner, did you have something? Um, I don't know. I forgot. But just to reconcile and kind of uh, anyway, end this, uh, it looks like we're going to have first reading next week. And then we'll have a public hearing um, in two weeks after that. So we're going to have plenty of time, I guess, to discuss this in more depth. Because uh, right now, uh, you know, we're not going to take any action tonight. So I'm, I'm just going to defer all of my comments in the way I feel at the appropriate time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I did remember. Um, what I was going to ask is about the county saying again that they're not going to be ready to do an election for anybody. Um, when I spoke to Marissa before, she said that they were moving in June and that they wouldn't be able to do a July election. So I said, well, if they're moving in June, they should be ready by July. Um, I would like to speak to the county commissioners and, and one, I want to know what's going on with that. And um, it just doesn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah, so my Maybe they shouldn't move the, um, the, the counter until this is all done. So my understanding from the county clerk is that there are election laws coming down on June 30th that require that they have cameras in place around their election equipment. It's updated security uh, measures that have to be done. And those cameras are being put in place at the Wells Fargo Center. And so they are moving their equipment to Wells Fargo Center before that deadline. Um, so that everything is installed and ready to go there. Um, but the reason that they would not be able to do uh, an earlier than July election is different from the reason that they wouldn't be able to do an August election. The reason they wouldn't be able to help us out in August is because at that point, they are getting their ducks in a row for the November ballot. And they're only able, the system apparently is only able to support one election at a time. So obviously, um, if we are moving forward with a special election. I will have another conversation with the county clerk. Um, she has been very kind and very willing to do whatever she can to help us 
um, but she has already said that that a later um, August selection would not work for her department. Is she certified finally? Uh, I believe that she'll be certified by May. By May. Okay. Councilor Flores. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the county clerk uh, is a position that's based on Colorado statute. The county commissioners have no authority over her. Uh, all of the county officials have their own statutory requirements. She answers to the Secretary of State and not to the county commissioners. Councilor Winter. <laughs> is it possible that we can have another county do this for us? Rather than a company that that charges an extraordinary amount of money? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, about that. I think part of the problem is a lot of this equipment can't be moved. Um, it gets certified where it's at, and if you move it, it breaks that certification, um, but it, it is something we can look into. Okay. All right. You know, it just, it just really seems like, it, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a constitutional right for the citizens to petition, and it just seems like this is being purposely sabotaged and blocked. And you can sit there and shake out your head all, all you want, but the optics are horrible here. Did you have anything, Mayor? You know, let me just clarify the record here. It's my job, one of the duties imposed by me as the mayor, by the city charter, is to faithfully execute and enforce the laws of the city of Pueblo and the state of Colorado to the extent that they apply to the city of Pueblo. So when I became aware of this error, it would have been a simple matter maybe to just ignore it and say that number we gave you, you didn't meet that, the petitions were insufficient, that's it. But it's clear here under Colorado, under our charter and under the Colorado constitution, the Colorado statutes, that 10% of the registered electors are required to have an election. If you don't have a petition with that threshold and you put a ballot issue on the election and it passes, you are in chaos because you did not meet the legal requirements to, to amend the city charter. So I think that's what we need to keep in mind. It's not that the, they were fooled. They did not meet the legal requirements to submit a charter amendment to the voters of the city of Pueblo. That's the bottom line uh, under the law. Uh, whether we misrepresented what the law was or not, the law wasn't met. Now, the city council can, if it wants, put it on the ballot. You know, this. we think that would be a bad idea to do that, especially the way this was written. But um, I don't know, Councilor Winter suggested a lawyer is now involved. Did a lawyer write this? I didn't suggest it. You have a copy of it right there. Did the Mr. lawyer Jagger write has this? A copy. Consti this you charter think amendment? It's written, look at it. Of course an attorney wrote it. Okay. Come on. Um. That's the other thing that I missed in our resolution is that maybe we shouldn't be approving the language of a ballot initiative if we're going to have to, if they're going to have. Right, that was already approved. You know, yeah. that's the thing is we went through the process, our law, law department of approving the ballot initiative uh, measure. And so um, that might be a resolution that we don't do if, if people are required to get their own attorney in the future, because we're, we're going to eventually work into a resolution of what we're going to want to do here in the future so this doesn't happen. And, right. you know, under the mayors, I mean, this is your administration, Mayor. Right, and this administration caught the air before right. there was any damage done. No, you caught the air. Right. I don't think there's anything more productive that we could talk about. Nice it sweetie. sounds like we're going to see it on Mondays um ordinance or sorry on monday's first reading presentation um councilor graham Councilor, can you get that information on how much this is gonna will that give you enough time or, or what what's that time frame look like can we expect a estimate on the costs or or what's that look like for you um i'm really not sure where to start on the agilis equipment so i would have to um, consult the county clerk um so could we have it before second works. reading I, I'll, I'll try to get that for Thank you. Okay, seeing no, Councilor Winner. Mr. Jagger, uh, would you be willing to meet with the uh, group? 
Well, what I was going to do is review it and make uh, red line changes necessary for form and then submit it to the group so they have it in advance of first or second reading. Okay, and you're gonna send it to the attorney also? I'll do whatever the group desires. All right, thank you. Now I'm confused again. Uh, Ms. Winter suggested that we just rescind and go back to the original. Hold on. Okay, sorry. Uh, or are we going to go with the wordage that the group wants? And the wordage that the group wants is a lot different. So what are we doing now? Yeah, are we you're going to just rescind and go back to what it was originally like? Or are we going to go with the verbiage that the group wants? In the, the chart, now we have two charter amendments on the table, basically. One says, uh, Ms. Winter just suggested that we just rescind, go back to the original like we used to be before, but that's not what the group wants. So if the citizen re citizenry wants <laughs> Charter B and Ms. Winter wants Charter A, which one are we going to do? <laughs> you know, just a little FYI, originally the group, Judalyn Smith, turned in uh, uh, rescinding the mayor uh, position completely. And then it came back from Kurgosik saying, no, this has to be, uh, you have to write out the charter amendment like it was in 2018. So um, uh, all, all that the group did was switch it from where it said mayor, went back to city manager. Um, and there were the, um, uh, just the administrative changes as far as the um, judge to report to the city council like it did before, and um, also the removal. That's my point. It's too different. It's not too different. That's not two different things. So we will have it together with Mr. Jagger here in, in, in within 24 hours, and you can look at it. So okay. My question, then, Ms. Winter, my understanding is you requested that the uh, proposed ballot be the charter amendment in the petition. Is that correct? Because I need to. That's start. correct, but we're going to we're going to work on it. So. Right, right. We're going to what back. we're going to do is um, we're going to meet and um, and 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 let you know. How does I, that? Sound? I don't have time for let you know. Okay, they're right if here. It, if you want it, I okay. Can so I, what I would say, what I would say at this point is to rescind. But we do need to take out the chief of, chief of staff because the city manager is this chief is of staff. This is why it's very difficult to do this in such a short time. Yeah. Frame. I can draft something. The direction I had when you called Friday was to do the petition, what the charter amendment in the petition. I right. can start working on that. Okay. But it sounds like the rest of council. Will the rest of council get to review the Petition and do we have input into it? Or are we just no. going to go with what all we're doing here? Is council member, council member has request input. that an ordinance be introduced. I'm being responsive, so that's where we're at. If we want to do it for a special, we need two ordinances. One's got to be the charter amendment. We do not have time to negotiate terms and conditions of the ordinance. It's just not going to work. So uh, the direction I have is to do the petition. If another council member wants me to draft another ordinance, I'm just telling you I'm running out of time here. So I think the whole situation arose because the petition, the issues related to it. Uh, so I can certainly approve that as to form, get those changes back to the petition. Okay, seeing no other business, I conclude this work session at 713.